Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for loving us and giving us a beautiful brand new day to not just be alive and to appreciate what we have, but Lord, to be alive and to focus upon you, our great God, our great creator. Thank you for the time to sing. Pray that now through your truth, you would just not only connect with our minds, but our hearts and encourage our spirits, Lord, as we seek to to honor you in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Have a seat if you would. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So uh, I was, I'm 0-2 for my football predictions for the weekend, just so you guys know. Uh, I was hoping the Falcons would pull out a win, and I hope for any team to beat the Patriots, just to be honest with you. But I was reading an interview with uh, Tom Brady's wife, Giselle Bunchen. Is that how you pronounce it? And uh, in this interview, Giselle, Tom Brady's wife, said this, that, She knows and she has come to understand that she is Tom's second love. She said that I know that football is his first love and I've come to accept the fact that I am his second love. That sucks. In the words of the the wisest theologian, that stinks, right? Which, in reality, it's true, isn't it? Because when I hear that, and as, as casually as that has passed over, you know, there are competing things in this world for our heart's affections. And I think about the topic of us humans being spiritual creatures and the one who has created us, God, and God does not tolerate rivals when it comes to our affections. And God is not a God who adopts the mentality of a Giselle that says, I understand that so-and-so loves this more than me. God demands that we love him first. And there's so much in our world and there's so much in creation that vies for our heart's affections. And if there's any message from Genesis that speaks louder than anything else is that God demands for us to love Him first. And perhaps this morning's message, this morning's topic is a chance for all of us to have a, a moment of realignment where we are coming out of a week where we've been tempted or enticed or been wooed to follow something else. And and this is God's opportunity to say, no, 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 no. You love me first. And why? Because you're going to see God perhaps today in a in a different light. Perhaps you're going to see God this morning in a way you've never imagined God. Because you cannot scoot past Genesis 1-1 without stopping and adoring, without stopping and worshiping, without stopping and admiring, right? Consider the words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, if you get this wrong, you won't understand anything else in Scripture. This is so pivotal, so important that we need to stop and meditate upon this verse in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth turn your outline uh you're going to take some notes this morning god is a god who says i want you to love me more than you love anything else that is our aim today And I just want you to know, because last week we covered four words, this morning we will cover six words, and we're two weeks in and we're not even past Genesis 1-1 yet. Someone actually calculated it, and at this speed, we won't get done with the first 11 chapters of Genesis till about 2036, but I want you to know that we're not going to take this long, but we need to do uh, due diligence with the scriptures and understand what God has given us here in his word. So on the way here this morning, I love it because my youngest child, Hudson, um, he wants to come with me to Sozo first thing. And so we're on the road about seven o'clock in the morning heading here. And uh, I don't know if any of you were up, but if you saw the sunrise, uh, it, it was amazing. And my son said, dad, look at God's 
beautiful painting given to us this morning. And I'm like sitting there going, proud dad moment, right? Like teaching my children that, you know, creation is meant to reflect the glory of God, the, the, the brilliance of God, the majesty of God. And that's what creation does. It points to how amazing God is and reminds us that there's a God out there, a designer behind it all, who aims not just to be glorified in that which involuntarily glorifies him, but us who have been created with the capability to voluntarily worship him. And so I pray that happens this morning as we look at Genesis 1-1. Three major points I want us to unpack this morning, and you can't help but get away from the fact that Genesis 1-1 assumes the existence of God. In the beginning, God. He is eternal. He is self-sufficient. He has always existed. And so we start with the topic of God, the executor of all creation, the architect behind it all. Now I want you to know that even though Genesis 1-1 gives us a starting point. It doesn't mean God started at Genesis 1-1. Because God is eternal, He has not started. He always has been. And I want to clue you in, in an amazing understanding when it comes to the person and work of God. That you need to really understand John 1, 1-3, before you understand Genesis 1-1. So look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to have it up on the screen, and we're actually going to go through several verses like this, but I want you to write these things down. You need to understand John 1 precedes Genesis 1, 1. Because here's what John says. In the beginning, notice how he, he starts with the same words of Genesis 1, 1. So he wants to give you this idea that there's something that happened even before Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we understand in the context, John's talking about the Word being Jesus. And that Jesus wasn't born or come into existence on Christmas morning like some of us have understood. But Jesus has always existed as the second member of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We're going to talk more about this here in a moment. This precedes Genesis 1.1. See, God is the uncaused cause of all creation. He is the one behind it all. And this is what the writer of Genesis wants us to understand. Now, as I just mentioned, this God exists in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all members of the Trinity involved in the work of creation. See, what you're going to see this morning is specifically the involvement of the Father and Son in creation. This is why Colossians 1 is important. Verses 16 and 17, Paul writes this in Colossians 1, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth. Does that language sound familiar, right? Genesis 1-1, heavens and earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So, This God who exists in triunity, not three gods, but one God in three persons, exists with this intrinsic relationship within itself that I would say is characterized by two things. Love and communication. The Trinity has always existed without needing something outside of itself for happiness, For satisfaction, God is totally fine with existing in and of himself without needing any creation. So before anything ever came about, God is. God was and God will forever be. But what I want you to understand and what the Bible points us to is this triune God celebrates two things that are intrinsic within his nature. And it is this, love and communication. 
See, if you understand this idea that God is a God that loves and he loves perfectly with himself and yet creates creation to reflect something of that love and especially you and me as human beings with this capacity to love like God loves, are you kidding me? Now we get to taste something of what love means even within the triune God, even though we will never get to that level of loving. But also the communication that exists within the Trinity, because John 1, 1, Colossians 1, give us the idea that there was a plan within the Godhead to bring something out of nothing. And there was a communication that existed that this plan was going to be good, that it was going to be righteous, that it was going to be awesome, and it was going to be something that would glorify God. And so what we have in Scripture, and we're going to unpack more in here in a moment, is that the, the Father speaks things into existence, and He does the speaking through the Son, and then everything comes into being. Now wrap your minds around that. And if that doesn't cause us to worship and adore God more, I don't know what, what will. So there is a love that is shared by the Father to the Son. There's a plan. There's a communication. And the promises that were made prior to the creation of the heavens and the earth are fantastic. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, Paul writes these words, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. So you notice how Paul is making the connection I'm making with you. The Father, the Son, love and communication. And we see the first two members of the Trinity working together within the singularity of being one God. Now you're asking yourself, what about the Spirit? What's the spiritual role in creation? We're going to get to that here in a couple weeks. But you notice in Genesis, in the verses to come, it is the spirit that hovers over the surface of the earth, bringing security, bringing preservation, bringing protection. And we'll talk about that more down the road. Romans eleven thirty six. Again, Paul emphasizes, for him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever and ever. So, again, to center our minds, center our hearts, there is a God behind it all. And this God is a personal God that has intrinsic within himself this, this incredible ability to love and communicate. And we see that now through creation, which is why the psalmist in Psalm 19, verse 1, and this is not on a slide, you'll have to write this down, the heavens declare the glory of God. The stars, the universe, the cosmos declares his praises. Talk about communication. That's awesome. And so what we can't get away from is the fact is that there is a God behind it all. Unlike the famous Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gangarin, who said when he went into outer space, his quote going back to earth was this, I don't see God out here. Interesting, huh? Cold War, Russia, right? Atheism is the primary worldview. There is no God. And Yuri sends back a message confirming, I don't see God out here. Well, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And Romans says in chapter 1 that we really suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. It makes sense. And we're going to talk about that more here in a bit. Second point is this. Created. See, creation is the expression of God's glory. Why is there something rather than nothing? Because again, I've already framed this whole conversation in the fact that God didn't need to create anything. He was totally self-satisfied within himself. But yet he chooses to create, I want you to know the main objective of why God brings something out of nothing is for his glory. And whether we're going macro universe or whether we're going micro universe, whether we're looking at 
uh, galaxies and constellations and nebulae that are so beyond us, or we're looking at the inner world of who we are as humans and looking through microscope and how atoms and, and things like that work, God gets the glory. See, what we have to understand is that this, this idea of God's glory really answers the what and why questions of life. See, the effect of these opening words of the Bible is to establish that God in his inscrutable wisdom, sovereign power and majesty is the creator of all things that exist and nothing ever existed before him. So the question is, how does something come from nothing? Because what we have in Genesis is in the beginning, God created how does god create especially when we are talking about words like time and space and matter well psalm 33 verse 6 the psalmist writes this by the word of the lord the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts hebrews chapter 11 Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. See, what we have to understand is that all God has to do is declare. All he has to do is speak. And so what we have in Genesis 1-1 is the declaration See, what we're going to look at in Genesis 1 and 2, these two chapters, is the explanation of it all. But all you need to know right now is that God is powerful enough just to speak, and it happens. Can you imagine this? The power of God in just speaking time, space, matter. Scientists, men and women throughout the centuries, have gone bonkers trying to explain the universe. How does something come from nothing? And yet God sits there and goes, and there it is, which gives us great encouragement that if God just speaks and we see evidence of his speaking power, how much more is he able to do things that we deem impossible? By his word, things are held together. And I'm going to tell you right now, this idea of God creating in verse 1, this word create is unique to God, and it's something that we do not share as human beings. See, only God creates. You need to understand this, that this word is used exclusively for God. We, men and women, do not create. We make things... We form things, but we don't create something new or something that did not exist before, right? The scientist who says we are in the laboratory, we are scientifically trying to discover the meaning and significance of all things is a dishonest scientist if they conclude that there is no God because what are the materials they're working with because they did not create those materials, the moment they are able to create their own H2O or their own this or own that, then we can talk. But the fact is, you cannot be an honest scientist and conclude there's no God unless you're able to create something out of nothing. Men and women do wonderful things with what has already been created, but only God can create. Think about this. Again, the universe we see, detect, measure was made from that which we cannot see, detect, or measure. So God's works, his creation, are all expressions of his glory. Two blanks. God's creation points to God's power, and his creation points to his wisdom. Let me talk about this again. So God speaks things into existence. This is where we get a phrase, a Latin phrase, and you guys thought Latin was a dead language, didn't you? Ex nihilo, out of nothing. See, this really dispels this whole Big Bang concept. You know, scientists arrive at this conclusion that there was a Big Bang, but having a Big Bang doesn't really answer the mysteries of the origins of all things. 
Because if something came out of nothing, there was nothing that existed prior to matter. And this is what drives the scientists bonkers. God reveals his power by creating everything merely by speaking the word. He exists and he brings something that never did exist before this. Consider the words of Paul in Romans 4, verse 17. Check this out. Paul writes to the Romans in verse 17 of chapter 4, these words. He says, God calls into being, what? To whom whom he believes, gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Whoa! See, Paul is framing this in a spiritual conversation where... We have to understand that God is a God supremely above and beyond us. And the fact that God, who not only gives life to the dead, which right then and there, that's a miracle, but calls into existence those things that do not even exist, this is awesome. And I want you to know, too, we sang a song this morning called Great is Our God. And you think about the lyric that says this. It's your breath in our lungs that we call out your name and we call out your praise. Think about this. It's your breath in our lungs. Stop and consider the weightiness of that truth. See, God is not a God who just stepped away from creation when he brought everything into existence. He's a God who is personally connected with our existence right now and that his perpetual preservation of your life is in his hands. He is speaking right now to, and saying, give Scott Morgan breath. Give his heart the ability to beat. Allow the blood to pulsate through his body. God is speaking that right now because at any moment God could say, Stop! And I fall over dead. Think about this. You only are alive right now because God is has a sustaining word which he's speaking, saying, I'm going to keep you alive. And I'm going to keep you alive. How many of you just praise God every morning you wake up because some re- somehow you survived the evening resting and sleeping? Beyond your ability, beyond your control, he kept your heartbeat and blood and everything where it needed to be so that you could wake up today and be alive because at any moment the speaking word of God could say, Stop. humbling it's sobering it's it's perhaps what makes our salvation in christ so amazing when we witness jesus at the tomb of lazarus and by a word he calls forth lazarus who has died to now be risen to life the very god who sustains us physically is the god that speaks into our spirits and says I will communicate to you who are spiritually dead and bring about spiritual life. Is this awesome or what? So God creates. He is powerful. And we come to the conclusion in the end that matter, write this down in your notes, matter is not eternal. God is. Matter has not always been. Everything began when God spoke it into existence. So if you reject creationism, if you reject everything I'm telling you this morning, you are to say somehow that substance itself must somehow be eternal. And scientists, even those scientists who don't believe in a God, will come to the conclusion that matter has not always existed. No substance in this world has the properties of, of eternality okay there is nothing in our world that we can touch study test that has the properties of eternality even einstein now you know we're going deep when we bring albert to the table einstein called this the incomprehensible comprehensibility of the universe He said that the universe is mind-like. Well, I want you to know 
that your minds are more than molecules in motion. Your minds do not have the ability to be rational and intelligent without some sort of rational mind or intelligence behind it. The idea that you experience things like self-awareness or love or longing or yearning points to characteristics of personhood that doesn't come about if matter has always existed. You should not be able to come to the conclusion that there is meaning and significance beyond this world. If things were merely materialistic and there is no God, then guess what? You have no reason to cry. You have no reason to feel pain. You have no reason to feel shock. You have no reason to be, you know, whatever, because there are essence of our personhood that communicates something of rationality and intelligence, and matter can't produce that. This is perhaps why, and I was just talking to, to, to Greg about, about before, there's a show, and I'm not necessarily recommending this, but there's a show that is so intriguing and touches on so many valuable topics. It's called Black Mirror. And I'll tell you what, this is, it's a tough show, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you right now, be careful. But what it is, is it takes these, these truths of what makes us human what are the elements of personhood and what effects do our world and technology and progress in these realms have on, on us as persons? It's not pretty. This is, a, this is not a Christian-based theme show, but it's touching every episode on things that I believe the writers really ultimately can't put their finger on because it has to do with the soulishness of men and women. C.S. Lewis, you know, you got you to throw C.S. Lewis in. I'm sorry, you guys, I'm a big C.S. Lewis fan. Please listen to what he says. The Christian says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there's such thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such thing as water. Man feels the desire for sex. Well, there's such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. It probably points to the fact that earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on one hand never to despise or to be unthankful for these earthly blessings, and on the other hand never to mistake them for something else of which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. Listen to this. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country which i shall not find till after death i must never let it get snowed under or turned aside i must make it the main object of my life to press on to that country and to help others do the same it's what it's what we do guys when we come together we're we're saying we're citizens of another world and we are to take those desires and those things that this world cannot satiate and say they are only found in God. So here it is, you guys. Here's the choice. Eternal God or eternal matter? What, what do you choose? Because the latter, eternal matter, is only an impossibility if the present scientific law of cause and effect is valid, since random particles of matter could not by themselves generate a complex, orderly, intelligible universe, not to mention living persons capable of applying intelligence to the understanding of the complex order of the universe. A personal God is the only adequate cause to produce such effects. And then there's God's wisdom, which out of his power brings meaning and significance to it all. 
We have a world that we see that there's design, there's complexity, there's intelligibility, and we know that there's a grand designer behind it. That's why you don't walk along the beach and find the completed works of Shakespeare there and go, wow, some random printing press must have just blown up randomly and assembled this volume. No. It is, it is about us realizing that there's a God behind it all. Acts chapter 14. These early people thought, you know, where do we come from? Why do we exist? And the, the, the disciples point to them. Men, why are you doing these things? We are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. There's a pointer to God who satisfies. And then in Acts 17, they talk about this again where Paul is in Athens on Mars Hill talking to the people who have assembled shrines to all gods and just to be safe they have an altar to an unknown god in case they leave any god out, right? And they say, the god who you are designed to worship is the god who made the world and everything in it being lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man. So there is wisdom and power behind it all. God the Father, through the agency of the eternal Son, created out of nothing all that is not God by the word of his command, and that that same word he upholds everything, even right now, today, so that the emergence of every new being has his unique touch and signature of design upon it, and he does it for his glory. If you ever doubted your worth or value or meaning or significance, it's in him you live and move and have your being. Today is the day to acknowledge that. As much as the, the sky this morning was God's painting, you are God's, not just his painting, the Bible says you are his masterpiece. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, you have been created in Christ for good works, that you should walk in those good works that were prepared before the foundation of everything. Why? Because you are God's masterpiece. You have significance. And that's one of those themes I'm going to flesh out as we go through Genesis, that you are unique in God's creation. Because worship, bringing glory to God from us humans, is something that no other creation piece of creation can do. As my favorite pastor uh, John Piper says, he says, you have the ability to glorify God because you've been created with the capability to do it voluntarily. The mountains don't have a choice. The cheetahs don't have a choice. The manatees oh, don't have a choice. The sea cows, oh, I love those creatures, right? None of these creatures, none of this creation has a choice. Only you and I have a choice in the matter. And God has created and brought something out of nothing. He didn't have to do it, but he did. Why? So that he could be seen as glorious and you and I could glorify him. But what did he create? Look at verse 1. I love how simple the writer presents it. The heavens and the earth. Before you just, go, all right, let's go to verse 2. No, you got to stop. Because the writer of Genesis is intentional by letting you know how significant the heavens and the earth are. Because this is the totality of all of God's creation. So, heavens and earth, the expanse, that's the blank, the expanse of God's creation. This answers the what question. What did God create? So here's this universe that comes into existence brand new a finite time ago by the creative action of God. And now you need to understand that heaven and earth refers to all that is not only seen, but also unseen. And this is where I believe you will begin to have some insight into things perhaps you've never thought about before. Because there is within creation a lower visible earthly reality 
And there is within creation a higher, invisible, and heavenly reality. And God is the creator of all. Two things. One is the created material world. And I want you to know that biblically, this generally refers to mankind's place. I mean, this is really what Genesis 1 and two spell out for us. So we're not going to do this this morning. We're not going to talk about the material world because the writer of Genesis goes to great lengths to tell us about the material created world. But what I want to do this morning with you in our closing time together is unpack the created spiritual world that is implied in this passage. And maybe we'll have a second King 6 experience where Elisha's servant was given spiritual eyes as the curtains of heaven are pulled back and he sees a spiritual war taking place that cannot be seen by physical earthly eyes. I can't tell you the impact as a young believer a book on the invisible realm had on my life that the Bible frequently references this place in the heavenlies where typically, biblically, it has to do with God's abode or God's dwelling place where there is a realm of creation that we barely even understand. The place where God dwells, the place where he has created angelic hosts to serve him, to worship him, and even some of them to turn away and disobey him. I mean, think about this. This is, this is not the stuff merely of, 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 of Black Mirror episodes or the sci-fi channel. This is stuff that the Bible is clear that says to us, the world we live in is more than just what is seen or observable to the human eye or scientific explanation. That there is a spiritual realm out there that stands for more than just the sky above. It refers to a higher world of angels, of God's throne, of God's glory. This is why Paul, twice, even in Ephesians chapter 1, says this in verse 3. He says in Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Where is this? Because right now you've been blessed in another location. He unpacks it more in verse 20. He says this. He that worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Where's Jesus? Have we lost him? No. The Bible says that he ascended to a very real place where he is right now seated at the right hand of God, and that place is called the heavenly place. And he's seated because it's a place of rule and sovereignty and authority. It's a place where he's seated because the job is done. No longer can sin and death reign over the the creation which God has deemed to deliver and rescue. And it says that not only is Christ seated there, but if you're in Christ, you have a relationship with Jesus, you're also seated there according to Colossians chapter 3. Do you think it would be beneficial to us to understand this unseen realm? You better believe it. Even Paul in Ephesians 6, and this is not up on the screen, starting in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, he talks about the spiritual war that your battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the unseen forces at work. See, there's two things you need to understand about this spiritual realm. It's not only God's holy habitation, it is also the place of God's heavenly host. And if you want to talk about creation order, God created the heavens first and then he created the earth. Isaiah 42 talks about that. Isaiah 45 talks about that. Even the writer of Genesis says, here's the order. God created the heavens and the earth. And perhaps 
a beautiful section of Job in chapter 38. It talks about how God was glorified by the angelic host as God created. Look at these verses, Job 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth, he says to Job. Right, as if Job needed some humbling. Right, because Job was angry with God. Job had horrible counselors in his life called friends that were not leading him in a good theological way. And, and basically God says, sit down, Job, I've got a lesson for you. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determines its measurements? Surely you know. You're coming to me with your fists all clenched and your attitude. Well, guess what? You're going to drop the attitude because you weren't there. Who stretched that line upon it? Or on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Front row seats, the angelic realm, is sitting there watching God, their creator, create. And they have a front row seat and they can do nothing but respond with shouts of joy. Because that's how good it is. When you stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon, your jaw drops. When you're at Yosemite and you're seeing El Capitan. When you're at the Salton Sea like my family was a couple weeks ago, which is disgusting. You still sit there and go, wow, this is part of God's creation. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why, but okay. But think about it. Where were you when Orion and Pleiades and this nebula were and the angels are said to be there? Wow, God, you are incredible. You are awesome. And they are shouting for joy. See, there are things taking place in the heavenly places that we are unaware of. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says, There upon the throne is the Lamb, and there are angelic hosts singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Holy, holy, holy is He. And it says this goes on day and night. There is an unseen realm that exists right now among the angelic hosts where there are, and the Bible doesn't give us a number, but there are hundreds of thousands and upon hundreds of thousands declaring the greatness of God. And you think you're great. Because you're, here you are on this minuscule little planet, right? In your minuscule little coffee house church. And, you know, we're sitting here like, but yet we, we, we taste it. We, we know how good God is because we, we have a foretaste of his greatness and his grandeur in Christ. And the angels are declaring this night and day. I think they're whispering to us, catch up, catch up. You're falling behind, you're lagging. Because they exist to worship him. Wow. He is served and surrounded by these heavenly hosts, these spiritual heavenly beings. And perhaps that's why Jesus said, you, my disciples, pray this way. Matthew 6. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which assumes that God's will is being done in heaven. Which means there's a place that we cannot see with our earthly eyes. But there is something being done in the heavenly places that's according to God's will, and it's being done. And I want you to notice these words. It's being done immediately, it's being done joyfully, and it's being done without question. There exists in the spiritual realms heavenly beings called angels doing God's will immediately, obediently, and without question. What's my problem? You think the angels have something to teach us? You better believe it. They exist to serve. They exist to worship. And perhaps that's a big takeaway right now as we just kind of close this time up. God, may we, who are the apex of your creation, do your will on earth as it's being done in heaven right now. 
And I will tell you that this is our response. Closing point. Closing point. Exclusive worship. God is not your second love. He is to be our first. Why? Because we only love Him because He first loved us. And this is where you seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. You just trust that everything else is going to be taken care of. Matthew 6, verse 33. So may our response be like that of the unseen realm, the unseen angelic host that serve Him day and night. If we are the ones that now have the ability to do it, who have been redeemed, who have been delivered, then we ought to do it. And we ought to do it immediately. And we ought to do it joyfully. And we ought to do it without question. Because Ephesians 1, here it is. Why is Jesus important? Because notice how we're bringing this all to the person work of Christ making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. He is the intersection. Things in heaven and things on earth. God reaches down from heaven through his son. We are able to reach up into heaven through the son. And because all things are being united in his son, Christ is tantamount. And so what's our response? Exclusive worship and let nothing vie for our heart's affection but God and God alone. Amen? Next week, more than just half a verse, more than just a verse, we're going to be looking at day one. God speaks. And then the week after, day two, God speaks. Day three, God, why? What is all this about? What do these things point out to us about God? We will uncover that together. Amen? Sorry for my intensity. (laughs) Sorry for this. This is stuff that, that moves us, moves me. And I want you to glorify God all the more because of it. Let's stand. Let's pray. Mm. it is a humbling realization father to even have breath right now and to utter words that somehow come together in a way that not only do we understand each other but lord you're able to understand us and it's only by your power that we're able to call upon you and just at a bare minimum say thank you Thank you for creating something out of nothing. By showing us your greatness and inviting us into relationship with you so that we can bring you glory and magnify your excellencies. You are awesome. And and we acknowledge that great are you, God. And it's your breath in our lungs that we we call out your name and we sing out your praise. And may we never take another breath for granted again. May we come to the realization of how much you have loved us and moved mountains to save us and did not spare even your own son to die for us. And the great lengths by which you have shown us your love, Lord, may we re-alter our lives and to say you, God, are exclusive of our worship now and forever. Thanks for time together. Thank you for this community, this family. You're so good to us, God. And it's all because of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great, great day, great week, all right?